Chapter 7. Conversation and Discovery When I returned, dinner was ready. This meal was devoured by my worthy relative, with avidity and veracity. His shipboard diet had turned his interior into a perfect gulf. The repast, which was more dangerous than Icelandic, was in itself nothing, but the excessive hospitality of our host made us enjoy it doubly. The conversation turned upon scientific matters, and M. Fredrickson asked my uncle what he thought of the public library. Library, sir, cried my uncle. It appears to me a collection of useless old volumes, and a beggarly amount of empty shelves. What? cried M. Fredrickson. Why, we have a thousand volumes of most rare and valuable works, some in the Scandinavian language, besides all the new publications from Copenhagen. A thousand volumes, my dear sir, where are they? cried my uncle. Scattered over the country, Professor Hardwick. We are very studious, my dear sir, though we do live in Iceland. Every farmer, every laborer, every fisherman can both read and write, and we think that books, instead of being locked up in cupboards, far from the sights of students, should be distributed as widely as possible. The books of our library are therefore passed from hand to hand without returning to the library shelves, perhaps for years. Then when foreigners visit you, there is nothing for them to see? Well, sir, foreigners have their own libraries. And our first consideration is that our humbler classes should be highly educated. Fortunately, the love of study is innate in the Icelandic people. In 1816, we founded the Literary Society of Mechanics Institute. Many fallen scholars of eminence are honorary members. We publish books destined to educate our people, and these books have rendered valuable services to our country. Allow me to have the honor, Professor Hardwick, to enroll you as an honorary member. My uncle, who already belonged to nearly every literary and scientific institution in Europe, immediately yielded to the amiable wishes of good M. Fredrickson. And now, he said after many expressions of gratitude and goodwill, if you will tell me what books you expect to find, perhaps I may be of assistance to you. I watched my uncle keenly. For a minute or two he hesitated, as if unwilling to speak. To speak openly was, perhaps, to unveil his projects. Nevertheless, after some reflection, he made up his mind. Well, M. Fredrickson, he said in an easy, unconcerned kind of way, I was desirous of ascertaining if, among other valuable works, you have any of the learned Arnis and Kosom. Arnis and Kosom, cried the professor of Reichivik. You speak of one of the most distinguished scholars of the 16th century, of the great naturalist, the great alchemist, the great traveler. Exactly so. One of the most distinguished gentlemen connected with Icelandic science and literature, as you say, sir. A man illustrious above all. Yes, sir. All this is true, but his works. We have none of them. Not in Iceland? There are none in Iceland or elsewhere, answered the other sadly. Why so? Because Arne St. Cousin was persecuted for heresy, and, and in 1573 his works were publicly burnt at Copenhagen by the hands of the common hangman. Very good, capital, murmured my uncle, to the great astonishment of the worthy Icelander. You said, sir... Yes, yes, all is clear. I see the link in the chain. Everything is explained. And I now understand why Arne St. Cousin, put out of court, forced to hide his magnificent discoveries was compelled to conceal beneath the veil of an incomprehensible cryptograph. The secret. What secret? A secret which, stammered my uncle. Have you discovered some wonderful manuscript? cried M. Fredrickson. No, no, I, I, I got carried away by my enthusiasm, a mere superstition. Very good, sir. But really, to turn to another subject. I hope you will not leave our island without examining into its mineralogical riches. Well, the fact is, I am rather late. So many learned men have been here before me. Yes, yes, but there's still much to be done, cried M. Fredrickson. You think so, said my uncle, his eyes twinkling with hidden satisfaction. Yes, you have no idea how many unknown mountains, glaciers, volcanoes there are which remain to be studied. Without moving from where we sit, I can show you one, yonder on the edge of the horizon. You see Sneffels. Ah, oh, yes, Sneffels, cried my uncle. None of the most curious volcanoes in existence, the crater of which has been rarely visited. Extinct? Extinct, any time these five hundred years, was the ready reply. Well, said my uncle, who dug his nails into his flesh and pressed his knees tightly together to prevent himself leaping up with joy. I have a great mind to begin my studies with an examination of the geological mysteries of this Mount Seifel, Faisal, what, what, what do you call it? Sneffels, my dear sir. 
This portion of the conversation took place in Latin, and I therefore understood all that had been said. I could scarcely keep my countenance when I found my uncle so cunningly concealing his delight and satisfaction. I must confess that his artful grimaces, put on to conceal his happiness, made him look like a new Mephistopheles. Yes, yes, he continued. Your proposition delights me. I will endeavor to climb to the summit of Sneffels, and if possible, would descend into a crater. I very much regret, continued M. Fredrickson, that my occupation will entirely preclude the possibility of my accompanying you. It would have been both pleasurable and profitable if I could have spared the time. No, no, a thousand times, no, cried my uncle. I do not wish to disturb the serenity of any man. I thank you, however, with all my heart. The presence of one so learned as yourself would no doubt have been most useful, but the duties of your office and profession before everything. In the innocence of his simple heart, our host did not perceive the irony of these remarks. I entirely approve your project, continued the Icelander after some further remarks. It is a good idea to begin by examining this volcano. You will make a harvest of curious observations. In the first place, how do you propose to get the Sneffels? By sea. I shall cross the bay. Of course, that is the most rapid route. Of course, but still it cannot be done. Why? We have not an available boat in all Reykjavik, replied the other. Well, what is to be done? You must go by land along the coast. It is longer, but much more interesting. Then I must have a guide. Of course, and I have your very man. Someone on whom I can depend. Yes, an inhabitant of the peninsula by which Sneffels is situated. He is a very shrewd and worthy man with whom you will be pleased. He speaks Danish like a Dane. When can I see him? Today? No, tomorrow. He will not be here before. Ah, <sighs> tomorrow be it, replied my uncle with a deep sigh. The conversation ended by compliments on both sides. During the dinner, my uncle had learned much of the history of Arne Sankinsum, the reasons for his mysterious and hieroglyphical document. He also became aware that his host would not accompany him on his adventurous expedition, and that next day we should have a guide. Chapter 8 The Eider Down Hunter Off at Last That evening, I took a brief walk on the shore near Reykjavik, after which I returned to an early sleep on my bed of coarse planks, where I slept the sleep of the jest. When I awoke, I heard my uncle speaking loudly in the next room. I rose hastily and joined him. He was talking in Danish with a man of tall stature and of perfectly Herculean build. This man appeared to be possessed of very great strength. His eyes, which started rather prominently from a very large head, the face belonging to which was simple and naive, appeared very quick and intelligent. Very long hair, which even in England would have been accounted exceedingly red, fell over his athletic shoulders. This native of Iceland was active and supple in appearance, though he scarcely moved his arms, being in fact one of those men who despise a habit of gesticulation common to southern people. Everything in this man's manner revealed the calm and phlegmatic temperament. There was nothing indolent about him, but his appearance spoke of tranquility. He was one of those who never seemed to expect anything from anybody, who liked to work when he thought proper, and whose philosophy nothing could astonish or trouble. I began to comprehend his character, simply from the way in which he listened to the wild and impassioned verbiage of my worthy uncle. While the excellent professor spoke sentence after sentence, he stood with folded arms, utterly still, motionless to all my uncle's gesticulations. When he wanted to say no, he moved his head from left to right. When he acquiesced, he nodded, so slightly that you could scarcely see the undulation of his head. This economy of motion was carried to the length of avarice. Judging from his appearance, I should have been a long time before I had suspected him to be what he was, a mighty hunter. Certainly his manner was not likely to frighten the game. How, then, did he contrive to get at his prey? My surprise was slightly modified when I knew that his tranquil and solemn personage was only a hunter of the Eider Duck, the down of which is, after all, the greatest source of the Icelander's wealth. In the early days of summer, the female of the Eider, a pretty sort of duck, builds its nest amid the rocks of the fjords, the name given to all narrow gulfs in Scandinavian countries, with which every part of the island is indented. No sooner has the Eider Duck made her nest than she lines the inside of it with the softest down from her breast. Then comes a hunter or trader, taking away the nest, the poor bereaved female begins her task over again and this continues as long as any either down is to be found. When she can find no more male birds set to work to see what he can do. As, however, his down is not so soft, and has therefore no commercial value, the hunter does not take the trouble to rob him of his nest lining. 
The nest is accordingly finished, the eggs are laid, the little ones are born, and the next year, the harvest of eider down is again collected. Now, as the eider duck never selects steep rocks or aspects to build its nest, but rather sloping and low cliffs near the sea, the Icelandic hunter can carry on his trade operations without much difficulty. He is like a farmer who has neither to plow, to sow, nor to harrow, only to collect his harvest. This grave, sententious, silent person, as phlegmatic as an Englishman on the French stage, was named Hans Bjelk. He had called upon us in consequence of the recommendation of M. Fridrikson. He was, in fact, our future guide. It struck me that I had sought the world over. I could not have found a greater contradiction to my impulsive uncle. They, however, readily understood one another. Neither of them had any thought about money. One was ready to take all that was offered him, the other ready to offer anything that was asked. It may readily be convinced, then, that an understanding was soon come to between them. Now the understanding was that he was to take us to the village of Stapi, situated on the southern slope of the peninsula of Sneffels, at the very foot of the volcano. Hans, the guide, told us the distance was about 22 miles, a journey which my uncle supposed would take about two days. But when my uncle came to understand that they were Danish miles, of 8,000 yards each, he was obliged to be more moderate in his ideas, and considering the horrible roads we had to follow, to allow eight or ten days for the journey. Four horses were prepared for us, two to carry the baggage, and two to bear the important weight of myself and uncle, Hans declaring that nothing would ever make him climb on the back of any animal. He knows every inch of that part of the coast, and promised to take us the very shortest way. His engagement with my uncle was by no means the seats with our arrival at Stapi. He was further to remain in his service during the whole time required for the completion of his scientific investigations, at the fixed salary of three rix dollars a week, being exactly fourteen shillings and two pence, minus one farthing, English currency. One stipulation, however, was made by the guide. The money was to be paid to him every Saturday night, failing which his engagement was at an end. The day of our departure was fixed. My uncle wished to hand the eider down hunter in advance, but he refused in one emphatic word. If the, which being translated from Icelandic into playing English, means after. The treaty concluded, our worthy guide retired without another word. A splendid fellow, said my uncle. Only he little suspects the marvelous part he is about to play in the history of the world. You mean then, I cried in amazement, that he should accompany us? To the interior of the earth, yes, replied my uncle. Why not? There were yet forty-eight hours to elapse before we made our final start. To my great regret... Our whole time was taken up in making preparations for our journey. All our industry and ability were devoted to packing every object in the most advantageous manner. The instruments on one side, the arms on the other, the tools here, and the provisions there. They were, in fact, four distinct groups. The instruments were, of course, of the best manufacture. 1. A centigrade thermometer of Eagle, counted up to 150 degrees, which to me did not appear half enough or too much. Too hot by half if the degree of heat was to ascend too high, in which case we should certainly be cooked. Not enough if you wanted to ascertain the exact temperature of springs or metal in a state of fusion. 2. A manometer worked by compressed air. An instrument used to ascertain the upper atmospheric pressure of the level of the ocean. Perhaps a common barometer would not have done as well, the atmospheric pressure being likely to increase in proportion as we descended below the surface of the earth. 3. A first-class chronometer made by Bosnes of Geneva, set at the meridian of Hamburg, from which Germans calculate as the English do from Greenwich and the French from Paris. 4. Two compasses, one for horizontal guidance, the other to ascertain the dip. 5. A night glass. 6. Two Rumkorf coils, which by means of a current of electricity, would ensure us a very excellent, easily carried, and certain means of obtaining light. 7. A voltaic battery of the newest principle. The thermometer, thermos and metron measure, an instrument for measuring the temperature of the air. Manometer, manos or metron measure, an instrument to show the density or rarity of gases. Chronometer, chronos, time, and metros, measure. A time measure, a superior watch. Rumkorf's coil, an instrument for producing currents of induced electricity of great intensity. It consists of a coil of copper wire, insulated by being covered with silk, surrounded by another coil of fine wire, also insulated, in which a momentary current is induced when a current is passed through the inner coil from a voltaic battery. 
When the apparatus is in action, the gas becomes luminous and produces a white and continued light. The battery and wire are carried in a leather bag, which the traveler fastens by a strap to his shoulders. The lantern is in front and enables a benign wanderer to see in the most profound obscurity. He may venture without fear of explosion into the midst of the most inflammable gases, and the lantern will burn beneath the deepest waters. H.D. Rumkorf, an able and learned chemist, discovered the induction coil. In 1864, he won the quinquennial French prize of 2,000 pounds for his ingenious application of electricity. A voltaic battery, so-called from Volta, its designer, is an apparatus consisting of a series of metal plates arranged in pairs, and subjected to the action of saline solutions for producing current of electricity. Our arms consisted of two rifles, with two revolving six-shooters. Why these arms were provided, it was impossible for me to say. I had every reason to believe that we had neither wild beasts nor savage natives to fear. My uncle, on the other hand, was quite as devoted to his arsenal as to his collection of instruments. And above all, was very careful with his provision of fulminating or gun cotton, warranted to keep in any climate and of which the expense of force was known to be greater than that of ordinary gunpowder. Our tools consisted of two pickaxes, two crowbars, a silken ladder, three iron-shot alpine poles, a hatchet, a hammer, a dozen wedges, some pointed pieces of iron, and a quantity of strong rope. You may conceive that the whole made a tolerable parcel, especially when I mentioned that the ladder itself was 300 feet long. Then there came the important question of provisions. The hamper was not very large, but tolerable satisfactory, for I knew that in concentrated essence of meat and biscuit, there was enough to last six months. The only liquid provided by my uncle was shitum, of water, not a drop. We had, however, an ample supply of gourds, and my uncle counted on finding water and enough to fill them, as soon as we commenced our downward journey. My remarks as to the temperature, the quality, and even as to the possibility of none being found, remained wholly without effect. To make up the exact list of our traveling gear, for the guidance of future travelers, add that we carried a medicine and surgical chest with all apparatus necessary for wounds, fractures, and blows, lint, scissors, lancets, in fact a perfect collection of horrible-looking instruments, a number of vials containing ammonia, alcohol, ether, goulard water, aromatic vinegar, in fact every possible and impossible drug. Finally, all the materials for working the Rumkov coil. My uncle had also been careful to lay in a goodly supply of tobacco, several flasks of very fine gunpowder, boxes of tinder, besides a large belt crammed full of notes and gold. Good boots rendered water tight were to be found to the number of six in the toolbox. My boy, with such clothing, with such boots, and such general equipment, said my uncle in a state of rapturous delight, we may hope to travel far. It took a whole day to put all these matters in order. In the evening, we dined with Baron Tromp, in company with the mayor of Reykjavik, and Dr. Heitlein, the greatest medical man in Iceland. M. Fridrikson was not present, and I was afterwards sorry to hear that he and the governor did not agree on some matters connected with the administration of the island. Unfortunately, the consequence was that I did not understand a word that was said at dinner, a kind of semi-official reception. One thing I can say, my uncle never left off speaking. The next day, our labor came to an end. Our worthy host delighted my uncle, Professor Hartwig, by giving him a good map of Iceland, a most important and precious document for a mineralogist. Our last evening was spent in a long conversation with M. Fridrikson, whom I liked very much, the more than I never expected to see him or anyone else again. After this agreeable way of spending an hour or so, I tried to sleep. In vain, with the exception of a few doses, my night was miserable. At five o'clock in the morning, I was awakened from the only real half-hour sleep of the night by the loud neighing of the horses under my window. I hastily dressed myself and went down into the street. Hans was engaged in putting the finishing stroke to our baggage, which he did in a silent, quiet way that won my admiration. And yet he did it admirably well. My uncle wasted a great deal of breath in giving him directions, but worthy Hans took not the slightest notice of his words. At six o'clock, all our preparations were completed, and M. Fridrikson shook hands heartily with us. My uncle thanked him warmly in the Icelandic language, for his kind hospitality, speaking truly from the heart. As for myself, I put together a few of my best Latin phrases and paid him the highest compliments I could. This fraternal and friendly duty performed, we sallied forth and mounted our horses. As soon as we were quite ready, M. Fridrikson advanced, and by way of farewell, called after me in the words of Virgil, 
words which appear to have been made for us, travelers starting for an uncertain destination. Et quacune viam deteret fortuna sequamor. And whichsoever way thou goest, may fortune follow. Chapter 9 Our start. We meet with adventures, by the way. The weather was overcast but settled, when we commenced our adventurous and perilous journey. We had neither to fear fatiguing heat nor drenching rain. It was, in fact, real tourist weather. As there was nothing I liked better than horse exercise, the pleasure of riding through an unknown country caused the early part of our enterprise to be particularly agreeable to me. I began to enjoy the exhilarating delight of traveling, a life of desire, gratification, and liberty. The truth is that my spirits rose so rapidly that I began to be indifferent to what had once appeared to be a terrible journey. After all, I said to myself, what do I risk? Simply to take a journey through a curious country, to climb a remarkable mountain, and if worse comes to worst, to descend into the crater of an extinct volcano. There could be no doubt that this is all this terrible segments in the done, as to the existence of a gallery, or of subterraneous passages leading into the interior of the earth. The idea was simply absurd, the hallucinations of a distempered imagination. All then that may be required of me I will do cheerfully, and will create no difficulty. It was just before we left Reykjavik that I came to this decision. Hans, our extraordinary guide, went first, walking with a steady, rapid, unvarying step. Our two horses with the luggage followed on their own accord, without requiring a whip or spur. My uncle and I came behind, cutting a very tolerable figure upon our small but vigorous animals. Iceland is one of the largest islands in Europe. It contains 30,000 square miles of surface, and has about 70,000 inhabitants. Geographers had divided it into four parts, and we had to cross a southwest quarter, which is a vernacular, it's called Sudvesterfjordur. Hans, on taking his departure from Reykjavik, had followed the lines of the sea. We took our way through poor and sparse meadows, which made a desperate effort every year to show a little green. They very rarely succeed in a good show of yellow. The rugged summits of the rocky hills were dimly visible on the edge of the horizon, through the misty fogs. Every now and then some heavy flakes of snow showed conspicuous in the morning light, while certain lofty and pointed rocks were first lost in the grey low clouds, their summits clearly visible above, like jagged reefs rising from a troublous sea. Every now and then a spur of rock came down through the arid ground, leaving us scarcely room to pass. Our horses, however, appeared not only well acquainted with the country, but by a kind of instinct, knew which was the best road. My uncle had not even the satisfaction of urging forward his steed by whip, spur, or voice. It was utterly useless to show any signs of impatience. I could not help smiling to see him look so big on his little horse. His long legs now and then touching the ground made him look like a six-foot centaur. Good beast, good beast, he would cry. I assure you that I begin to think no animal is no intelligent than an Icelandic horse. Snow, tempest, impractical roads, rocks, icebergs, nothing stops him. He is brave, he is sober, he is safe. He never makes a false step, never glides or slips from his path. I dare to say that if any river, any fjord has to be crossed, and I have no doubt there will be many, you will see him enter the water without hesitation like an amphibious animal, and reach the opposite side in safety. We must not, however, attempt to hurry him. We must allow him to have his own way and I will undertake to say that between us we shall do our ten leagues a day. We may do so, was my reply. But what about our worthy guide? I have not the slightest anxiety about him. That sort of people go ahead without knowing even what they are about. Look at Hans. He moves so little it's impossible for him to become fatigued. Besides, if he were to complain of weariness, he would have to loan of my horse. I should have a violent attack of the cramp if I were not to have some sort of exercise. My arms are right, but my legs are getting a little stiff. All this while, we were advancing at a rapid pace. The country we had reached was already nearly a desert. Here and there could be seen an isolated farm, some solitary burr or Icelandic house built of wood, earth, fragments of lava, looking like beggars on the highway of life. These wretched and miserable huts excited in us such pity that we felt half disposed to leave alms at every door. In this country, there are no roads, paths are nearly unknown, and vegetation, poor as it was, slowly as it reached perfection, soon obliterated all traces of the few travelers who passed from place to place. Nevertheless, this division of the Providence, situated only a few miles from the capital, is considered one of the best cultivated and most thickly peopled in all Iceland. What, then, must be the state of the less known and more distant parts of the island? 
After traveling fully half a Danish mile, we had met neither a farmer at the door of his hut, nor even a wandering shepherd with his wild and savage flock. A few stray cows and sheep were only seen occasionally. What then must we expect when we come to the upheaved regions, to the districts broken and roughened from volcanic eruptions and subterraneous commotions? We were to learn this all in good time. I saw, however, on consulting the map, that we avoided a good deal of this rough country by following the winding and desolate shores of the sea. In reality, the great volcanic movement of the island, and all its attendant phenomena, are concentrated in the interior of the island. There, horizontal layers of strata or rocks, piled one upon the other, eruptions of basaltic origin and streams of lava, had given this country a kind of supernatural reputation. Little did I expect, however, the spectacle which awaited us when we reached the peninsula of Sneffels, where agglomerations of nature's ruins form a kind of terrible chaos. Some two hours or more after we had left the city of Reykjavik, we reached a little town called Alkurtia, or the principal church. It consists simply of a few houses, not what in England or Germany we should call a hamlet. Hans stopped here one half hour. He shared our frugal breakfast, answered yes and no to my uncle's questions as to the nature of the road, and at last when asked where we were to pass the night was a laconis as usual. Gordor was his one word of reply. I took occasion to consult the map, to see where Gardar was to be found. After looking keenly, I found a small town of that name on the borders of the Halford, about four miles from Reykjavik. I pointed this out to my uncle, who made a very energetic grimace. Only four miles out of the twenty-two? Why is this only a little walk? He was about to make some energetic observation to the guide, but Hans, without taking the slightest notice of him, went in front of the horses and walked ahead with the same imperturbable phlegm he had always exhibited. Three hours later, still traveling over those apparently interminable and sandy prairies, we were compelled to go around the Colchifert, an easier and shorter cut than crossing the gulfs. Shortly after we entered a place of communal jurisdiction called Uzberg, and the clock of which would then have struck twelve, if any Icelandic church had been rich enough to possess so valuable and useful an article. These sacred edifices are, however, very much like these people, who do without watches, and never miss them. Here the horses were allowed to take some rest and refreshment, then followed a narrow strip of shore between high rocks and the sea. They took us without further halt to the Alcajira of Branter, and another mile of Sabra and Nexia, a chapel of ease, situated on the southern bank of the Halford. It was four o'clock in the evening, and we had traveled four Danish miles, about equal to twenty English. The fjord was in its place about half a mile in width, the sweeping and broken waves came rolling in upon the pointed rocks. The gulf was surrounded by rocky walls. A mighty cliff, 3,000 feet in height, remarkable for its brown strata, separated here and there by beds of tufa on a reddish hue. Now, whatever may have been the intelligence of our horses, I had not the slightest reliance upon them, as a means of crossing a stormy arm of the sea. To ride over salt water upon the back of a little oar seemed to me absurd. If they really are intelligent, I said to myself, they will certainly not make the attempt. In any case, I shall trust rather to my own intelligence than theirs. But my uncle was in no humor to wait. He dug his heels into the sides of his steed and made for the shore. His horse went to the very edge of the water, sniffed the approaching wave, and retreated. My uncle, who was, sooth to say, quite an obstinate as a beast he bestrode, insisted on his making the desired advance. This attempt was followed by a new refusal on the part of the horse, which quietly shook his head. This demonstration of rebellion was followed by a volley of words and a stout application of whipcord, also followed by kicks on the part of the horse, which threw its head and heels upward and tried to throw his rider. At length, the sturdy little pony, spreading out his legs in a stiff and ludicrous attitude, got from under the professor's legs, and left him standing with both feet on a separate stone, like the Colossus of Rhodes. Wretched animal! cried my uncle, suddenly transformed into a foot passenger, and as angry and ashamed as a dismounted cavalry officer on the field of battle. Varja, said the guide, tapping him familiarly on the shoulder. That? A ferry boat? There, answered Hans, pointing to where lay the boat in question. There. Well, I cried, quite delighted with the information. So it is. Why did you not say so before? cried my uncle. Why not start at once? Did Varten, said the guide. What does he say? I asked, considerably puzzled by the delay in the dialogue. He says tide. 
replied my uncle, translating the Danish word from my information. Of course I understand. We must wait till the tide serves. For weiter? asked my uncle. Ja, replied Hans. My uncle frowned, stamped his feet, and then followed the horses to where the boat lay. I thoroughly understood and appreciated the necessity for waiting before crossing the fjord. For that moment when the sea is at its highest point is in a state of slack water. At neither the ebb nor flow can then be felt. The ferry boat was in no danger of being carried out to sea or dashed upon the rocky coast. The favorable moment did not come until six o'clock in the evening. Then my uncle, myself, and guide, two boatmen and the four horses got into a very awkward flat bottom boat. Accustomed as I had been to the steam ferry boat to the Elbe, I found the long oars of the boatmen but sorry means of locomotion. We were more than an hour in crossing the fjord, but at length the passage was concluded without accident. Half an hour later, we reached Gadar. Chapter 10. Traveling in Iceland. It ought, one would have thought, to have been night, even in the 65th parallel of latitude. But still the nocturnal illumination did not surprise me. For in Iceland, during the months of June and July, the sun never sets. The temperature, however, was very much lower than I expected. I was cold, but even that did not affect me so much as ravenous hunger. Welcome indeed, therefore, was the hut which hospitably opened its doors to us. It was merely the house of a peasant, but in the matter of hospitality, it was worth of being the palace of a king. As we alighted at the door, the master of the house came forward, held out his hand, and without any further ceremony signaled to us to follow him. We followed him, for to accompany him was impossible. A long, narrow, gloomy passage led into the interior of this habitation, made from beams roughly squared by the axe. This passage gave ingress to every room. The chambers were four in number, the kitchen, the workshop, where the weaving was carried on, the general sleeping chamber of the family, and the best room, to which strangers were especially invited. My uncle, whose lofty stature had not been taken into consideration when the house was built, contrived to knock his head against the beams of the roof. We were introduced into our chamber. A kind of large room with a hard earthen floor, and lighted by a window, the panes of which were made of a sort of parchment from the intestines of sheep, very far from transparent. The bedding was composed of dry hay thrown into two long red wooden boxes, ornated with sentences painted in Icelandic. I really had no idea that we should be made so comfortable. There was one objection to the house, and that was the very powerful odor of dried fish, of macerated meat, and of sour milk, which three fragrances combined did not at all suit my olfactory nerves. As soon as we had freed ourselves from our heavy traveling costume, the voice of our host was heard calling to us to come into the kitchen, the only room in which the Icelanders ever make any fire, no matter how cold it may be. My uncle, nothing loath, hastened to obey this hospitable and friendly invitation. I followed. The kitchen chimney was made of an antique model. A large stone standing in the middle of the room was the fireplace. Above in the roof was a hole for the smoke to pass through. This apartment was kitchen, parlor, and dining room, all in one. On our entrance, our worthy host, as if he had not seen us before, advanced ceremoniously, uttered a word which means be happy, and then kissed both of us on the cheek. His wife followed, pronounced the same word, with the same ceremonial, then the husband and wife, placing their right hands upon their hearts, bowed profoundly. This excellent Icelandic woman was the mother of nineteen children, who, little and big, rolled, crawled, and walked about in the midst of volumes of smoke, arising from the angular fireplace in the middle of the room. Every now and then I could see a fresh white head, and a slightly melancholy expression of countenance, peering at me through the vapor. Both my uncle and myself, however, were very friendly with the whole party, and before we were aware of it, there were three or four of those little ones on our shoulders, as many on our boxes and the rest hanging about our legs. Those who could not speak kept crying out Selvertu, in every possible and impossible key. Those who did not speak made all the more noise. This concert was interrupted by the announcement of supper. At this moment, our worthy guide, the Eater Duck Hunter, came in after seeing to the feeding and stabling of the horses, which consisted in letting them loose to browse on the stunted green of the Icelandic prairies. There was little for them to eat, but moss and some very dry and nutritious grass. Next day, they were ready before the door, some time before we were. Welcome, said Hans. Then tranquilly, with the air of an automaton, without any more expression in one kiss than another, he embraced the host and hostess and their nineteen children. This ceremony concluded to the satisfaction of all parties. 
We all sat down to table. That is twenty-four of us, somewhat crowded. Those who were best off had only two juveniles on their knees. As soon, however, as the inevitable soup was placed on the table, the natural taciturnity, common even to Icelandic babies, prevailed over all else. Our host filled our plates with a portion of lichen soup of Iceland moss, of by no means disagreeable flavor, and an enormous lump of fish floating in sour butter. All that there came some skir, a kind of curds and whey, served with biscuits and a juniper berry juice. To drink, we had blonda, skimmed milk with water. I was hungry, so hungry that by way of dessert, I finished up with a basin of thick oat and porridge. As soon as the meal was over, the children disappeared, whilst the grown people sat around the fireplace, on which was placed turf, heather, cow dung, and dried fish bones. As soon as everybody was sufficiently warm, a general dispersion took place, all retiring to their respective couches. Our hostess offered to pull off our stockings and trousers, according to the custom of the country, but as we graciously declined to be so honored, she left us to our bed of dry fodder. The next day, at five in the morning, we took our leave of these hospitable peasants. My uncle had great difficulty in making them accept a sufficient and proper remuneration. Hans then gave the signal to start. We had scarcely got a hundred yards from Garter when the character of the country changed. The soil began to be marshy and boggy and less favorable to progress. To the right, the range of mountains was prolonged indefinitely like a great system of natural fortifications, of which we skirted the glaciers. We met with numerous streams and rivulets which it was necessary to ford, and that without wetting our baggage. As we advanced, the deserted appearance increased, and yet now and then we could see human shadows flitting in the distance. When a sudden turn of the track brought us within easy reach of one of these specters, I felt the sudden impulse of disgust at the sight of a swollen head, with shining skin, utterly without hair, and whose repulsive and revolting wounds could be seen through his rags. The unhappy wretches never came forward to beg. On the contrary, they ran away. Not so quick, however, but that Hans was able to salute them with the universal salver too. Spetilsks, said he. A leper, explained my uncle. The very sound of such a word caused a feeling of repulsion. The horrible affliction known as leprosy, which has almost vanished before the effects of modern science, is common in Iceland. It is not contagious, but hereditary, so that marriage is strictly prohibited to these unfortunate creatures. These poor leopards did not tend to enliven our journey, the scene of which was inexpressibly sad and lonely. The very last tufts of grassy vegetation appeared to die at our feet. Not a tree was to be seen except a few stunted willows about as big as blackberry bushes. Now and then we watched a falcon soaring in the gray and misty air, taking his flight towards warmer and sunnier regions. I could not help feeling a sense of melancholy come over me. I sighed from my own native land, and wished to be back with Gretchen. We were compelled to cross several little fjords, and at last came to a real gulf. The tide was at its height, and we were able to go over at once and reach the hamlet of Alftanes, about a mile farther. That evening, after fording the Alpha and the Heta, two rivers rich in trout and pike, we were compelled to pass the night in a deserted house, worthy of being haunted by all the fays of Scandinavian mythology. The King of Cold had taken up his residence there and made us feel his presence all night. The following day was remarkable by its lack of any particular incidents. Always the same damp and swampy soil, the same dreary uniformity, the same sad and monotonous aspect of scenery. In the evening, having accomplished the half of our projected journey, we slept at the Annexia of Crosolt. For a whole mile we had under our feet nothing but lava. This disposition of the soil is called hrom. The crumbled lava on the surface was in some instances like ship cables, stretched out horizontally, and others coiled up in heaps. An immense field of lava came from the neighboring mountains, all extinct volcanoes, but whose remains showed what once they had been. Here and there could be made out the steam from hot water springs. There was no time, however, for us to take more than a cursory view of these phenomena. We had to go forward with what speed we might. Soon the soft and swampy soil again appeared under the feet of our horses, while at every hundred yards we came upon one or more small lakes. Our journey was now in a westerly direction. We had, in fact, swept round the great bay of Faxa, and the twin white summits of Sneffels rose to the clouds at a distance of less than five miles. The horses now advanced rapidly. The accidents and difficulties of the soil no longer checked them. I confess that fatigue began to tell severely upon me, 
but my uncle was as firm and as hard as he had been on the first day. I could not help admiring both the excellent professor and the worthy guide, for they appeared to regard this rugged expedition as a mere walk. On Saturday, the 20th of June at 6 o'clock in the evening, we reached Budir, a small town picturesquely situated on the shore of the ocean, and here the guide asked for his money. My uncle settled with him immediately. It was now the family of Hans himself, that is to say, his uncles, his cousins, German, who offered us hospitality. We were exceedingly well received, and without taking too much advantage of the goodness of these worthy people, I should have liked very much to have rested with them after the fatigues of the journey. But my uncle, who did not require rest, had no idea of anything of the kind, and despite the fact that next day was Sunday, I was compelled once more to mount my steed. The soil was again affected by the neighboring of the mountains, whose granite peered out of the grounds like tops of an old oak. We were skirting the enormous base of the mighty volcano. My uncle never took his eyes from off it. He could not keep from gesticulating and looking at it with a kind of sullen defiance as much as to say, that is the giant I have made up my mind to conquer. After four hours of steady traveling, the horses stopped of themselves before the door of the presbytery of Stapi. Chapter 11 We reached Mount Sneffels, the Reykir. Stapi is a town consisting of 30 huts, building on a large plain of lava, exposed to the rays of the sun, reflected from the volcano. It stretches its humble tenements along the end of a little fjord, surrounded by a basaltic wall of the most singular character. Basalt is a brown rock of igneous origin. It assumed regular forms, which astonished by their singular appearance. Here we found nature proceeding geometrically, and working quite after a human fashion, as if she had employed the plummet line, the compass, and the rule. If elsewhere she produces grand artistic effects by piling up huge masses without order or connection, if elsewhere we see truncated cones, imperfect pyramids, with an odd succession of lines, here as if wishing to give a lesson in regularity, and preceding the architects of the early ages. She has erected a severe order of architecture, which neither the splendors of Babylon nor the marvels of Greece ever surpassed. I had often heard of the Giant's Causeway in Ireland, and of Fingal's Cave in one of the Hebrides, but the grand spectacle of a real basaltic formation had never yet come before my eyes. This Estapi gave us an idea of one and all of its wonderful beauty and grace. The wall in the fjord, like nearly the whole of the peninsula, consisted of a series of vertical columns in height about 30 feet. These upright pillars of stone of the finest proportions supported an arch vault of horizontal columns, which formed a kind of half-vaulted roof above the sea. At certain intervals and below this natural basin, the eye was pleased and surprised by the sight of oval openings, through which the outward waves came thundering in volleys of foam. Some banks of basalt, torn from their fastenings by the fury of the waves, lay scattered on the ground like the ruins of an ancient temple, ruins internally young, over which the storms of ages swept without producing any perceptible effect. This was the last stage of our journey. Hans had brought us along with fidelity and intelligence, and I began to feel somewhat more comfortable when I reflected that he was to accompany us still farther on our way. When we halted before the house of the rector, a small and incommodious cabin, neither handsome nor more comfortable than those of his neighbors, I saw a man in the act of shoeing a horse, a hammer in his hand, and a leathern apron tied around his waist. Be happy, said the Eider town hunter, using his natural salutation in his own language. Good day, good day, replied the former in excellent Danish. Turko herde, cried Hans, turning round and introducing him to my uncle. Director, repeated the worthy professor. It appears, my dear Harry, that this worthy man is a vector, and is not above doing his own work. During the speaking of these words, the guide intimated to the Kirkerherd what was the true state of the case. The good man, seizing from his occupation, gave a kind of halloo, upon which a tall woman, almost a giantess, came out of the hut. She was at least six feet high, which in that region is something considerable. My first impression was one of horror. I thought she had come to give us the Icelandic kiss. I had, however, nothing to fear, for she did not even show much inclination to receive us into her house. The room devoted to strangers appeared to me to be by far the worst in this presbytery. It was narrow, dirty, and offensive. There was, however, no choice about the matter. The rector had no notion of practicing the usual cordial and antique hospitality. Far from it. 
Before the day was over, I found we had to deal with a blacksmith, a fisherman, a hunter, a carpenter, anything but a clergyman. It must be said in his favor that we had caught him on a weekday. Probably he appeared to greater advantage on the Sunday. These poor priests receive from the Danish government a most ridiculously inadequate salary, and collect one quarter of the tithe for their parish. Not more than sixty marks current, or about L310s, tens, sterling. Hence the necessity of working to live. In truth, we soon found that our host did not count civility among the cardinal virtues. My uncle soon became aware of the kind of man he had to deal with. Instead of a worthy and learned scholar, he found a dull, ill-mannered peasant. He therefore resolved to start on his great expedition as soon as possible. He did not care about fatigue, and resolved to spend a few days in the mountains. The preparations for our departure were made the very next day after our arrival at Stapi. Hans now hired three Icelanders to take the place of the horses, which could no longer carry our luggage. When, however, these worthy islanders had reached the bottom of the crater, they were to go back and leave us to ourselves. This point was settled before they would agree to start. On this occasion, my uncle partially confided in Hans, the eater duck hunter, and gave him to understand that it was his intention to continue his exploration of the volcano to the last possible limits. Hans listened calmly and then nodded his head. To go there or elsewhere to bury himself in the bowels of the earth or to travel over its summits was all the same to him. As for me, amused and occupied by the incidents of travel, I had begun to forget the inevitable future. But now I was once more destined to realize the actual state of affairs. What was to be done? Run away? But if I really had intended to leave Professor Hardwick to his fate, it should have been at Hamburg and not at the foot of Snuffles. One idea, above all others, began to trouble me. A very terrible idea. And one calculated to shake the nerves of a man even less sensitive than myself. Let us consider the matter, I said to myself. We are going to ascend the Snuffles Mountain, well and good. We are about to pay a visit to the very bottom of the crater. Good, still. Others have done it and did not perish from that course. That, however, is not the whole matter to be considered. If a road really does present itself by which to descend into the dark and subterraneous bowels of Mother Earth, is this thrice unhappy Sankism really told the truth? We shall be most certainly lost in the midst of the labyrinth of subterraneous galleries of the volcano. Now we have no evidence to prove that Sneffels is really extinct. What proof have we that an eruption is not shortly about to take place? Because the monster has slept soundly since 1219, does it follow that he is never to wake? If he does wake, what is to become of us? These were questions worth thinking about, and upon them I reflected long and deeply. I could not lie down in search of sleep without dreaming of eruptions. The more I thought, the more I objected to be reduced to the state of dross and ashes. I could stand it no longer, so I determined at last to summit the whole case to my uncle. In the most adjuvant manner possible, and under the form of some totally irreconceivable hypothesis, I sought him. I laid before him my fears, and then drew back in order to let him get his passion over at his ease. I have been thinking about Tamata, he said, in the quietest tone in the world. What did he mean? Was he at last about to listen to the voice of reason? Did he think of suspending his projects? It was almost too much happiness to be true. I, however, made no remark. In fact, I was only too anxious not to interrupt him, and allowed him to reflect at his leisure. After some moments, he spoke out. I have been thinking about Samata, he resumed. Ever since we have been at Stapi, my mind has been almost solely occupied with the grave question which has been submitted to me by yourself, for nothing would be unwiser or more inconsistent than to act with imprudence. I heartily agree with you, my dear uncle, was my somewhat hopeful rejoinder. It is now six hundred years since Nevels has spoken, but though now reduced to a state of utter silence, he may speak again. No volcanic eruptions are always preceded by perfectly well-known phenomena. I have closely examined the inhabitants of this region. I have carefully studied the soil. And I beg to tell you emphatically, my dear Harry, there will be no eruption at present. As I listened to his positive affirmations, I was stupefied and could say nothing. I see you doubt my word, said my uncle. Follow me. I obeyed mechanically. Leaving the presbytery, the professor took a road through an opening in the basaltic rock, which led far away from the sea. We were soon in open country, if we could give such a name to a place all covered with volcanic deposits. The whole land seemed crushed under the weight of enormous stones, of trap, of basalt, of granite, of lava, and of all other volcanic substances. 
I could see many spouts of steam rising in the air. These white vapors, called in the Icelandic language Rekir, come from hot water fountains, and indicate by their violence the volcanic activity of the soil. Now the sight of these appeared to justify my apprehension. I was therefore all the more surprised and mortified when my uncle thus addressed me. You see all this smoke, Harry, my boy? Yes, sir. Well, as long as you can see them thus, you have nothing to fear from the volcano. And how can that be? Be careful to remember this, continued the professor. At the approach of an eruption, these spouts of vapor redoubled their activity, to disappear altogether during the period of volcanic eruption. For the elastic fluids, no longer having the necessary tension, seek refuge in the interior of the crater, instead of escaping through the fissures of the earth. If, then, the steam remains in its normal and habitual state, if their energies does not increase, and if you add to this the remark that the wind is not replaced by heavy atmospheric pressure and dead calm, you may be quite sure that there is no fear of any immediate eruption. But enough, my boy. When science has sent forth her fiat, it is only to hear and obey. I came back to the house quite downcast and disappointed. My uncle had completely defeated me with his scientific arguments. Nevertheless, I still had one hope, and that was, when once we were at the bottom of the crater, that it would be impossible in default of a gallery or tunnel to descend any deeper, and this despite all the learned sancusms of the world. I passed the whole of the following night with a nightmare on my chest, and after unheard of miseries and tortures, found myself in the very depths of the earth from which I was suddenly launched into planetary space, under the form of an eruptive rock. The next day, June 23rd, Hans calmly awaited us outside the presbytery with his three companions loaded with provisions, tools, and instruments. Two iron shot shovels, two guns, and two large game bags were reserved for my uncle and myself. Hans, who was a man who never forgot even the minutest precautions, had added to our baggage a large skin full of water, as an addition to our gourds. This assured us water for eight days. It was nine o'clock in the morning when we were quite ready. The rector and his huge wife or servant, I never knew which, stood at the door to see us off. They appeared to be about to inflict on us the usual final kiss of the Icelanders. To our supreme astonishment, their ado took the shape of a formidable bill, in which they even counted the use of the pastoral house, really and truly the most abominable and dirty place I ever was in. The worthy couple cheated and robbed us like a Swiss innkeeper, and made us feel, by the sum we had to pay, the splendors of their hospitality. My uncle, however, paid without bargaining. A man who had made up his mind to undertake a voyage into the interior of the earth is not a man to haggle over a few miserable rix dollars. This important matter settled. Hans gave the signal for departure, and some few moments later, we had left Stoppy. Chapter 12. The Ascent of Mount Sneffels the huge volcano, which was the first stage of our daring experiment, is above 5,000 feet high. Sneffels is the termination of a long range of volcanic mountains, of a different character of the system of the island itself. One of its peculiarities is its two huge pointed summits. From whence we started, it was impossible to make out the real outlines of the peak against the gray field of sky. All we could distinguish was a vast dome of white, which fell downward from the head of the giant. The commencement of the great undertaking filled me with awe. Now that we had actually started, I began to believe in the reality of the undertaking. Our party formed quite a procession. We walked in single file, preceded by Hans, the imperturbable eater duck hunter. He calmly led us by narrow paths, where two persons could by no possibility walk abreast. Conversation was wholly impossible. We had all the more opportunity to reflect and admire the awful grandeur of the scene around. Beyond the extraordinary basaltic wall of the fjord of Stapi, we found ourselves making our way through fibrous turf, over which grew a scanty vegetation of grass, the residuum of the ancient vegetation of the swampy peninsula. The vast mass of this combustible, the field of which was yet is utterly unexplored, would suffice to warm Iceland for a whole century. This mighty turf pit, measured from the bottom of certain ravines, is often not less than 70 feet deep and presents to the eye the view of successive layers of black-burned-up rocky detritus, separated by thin streaks of porous sandstone. The grandeur of the spectacle was undoubted, as well as its arid and deserted air. As a true nephew of the great Professor Hardwig, and despite my preoccupation and doleful fears of what was to come, I observed with great interest the vast collection of meteorological curiosities spread out before me in this vast museum of natural history. Looking back to my recent studies, 
I went over and thought the whole geological history of Iceland. This extraordinary and curious island must have made its appearance from out of the great world of waters at a comparatively recent date. Like the coral islands of the Pacific, it may, for aught we know, be still rising by slow and imperceptible degrees. If this really be the case, its origin can be attributed to only one cause, that of the continued action of subterranean fires. This was a happy thought. If so, if this were true, away with the theories of Sir Humphrey Davy, away with the authority of the parchment of Arne Sancosum, the wonderful pretensions to discovery on the part of my uncle, and to our journey. All must end in smoke. Charmed with the idea, I began more carefully to look about me. A serious study of the soil was necessary to negative or confirm my hypothesis. I took in every item of what I saw, and I began to comprehend the succession of phenomena, which had preceded its formation. Iceland, being absolutely without sedimentary soil, is composed exclusively of volcanic tuffa. That is to say, of an agglomeration of stones and of rocks of a porous texture. Long before the existence of volcanoes, it was composed of a solid body of massive trap rock lifted bodily and slowly out of the sea by the action of the centrifugal force at work in the earth. The internal fires, however, had not as yet burst their bounds and flooded the exterior cake of Mother Earth with hot and raging lava. My readers must excuse this brief and somewhat pedantic geological lecture, but it is necessary to the complete understanding of what follows. At a later period in the world's history, a huge and mighty fissure must, reasoning by analogy, have been dug diagonally from the southwest to the northeast of the island, through which by degrees followed the volcanic crust. The great and wondrous phenomena then went on without violence. The outpouring was enormous, and the seething fused matter, injected from the bowels of the earth, spread slowly and peacefully in the form of vast level plains, or what are called mammalons or mountains. It was at this epoch that the rocks called feldspars, cyanites, and porphyries appeared. But as natural consequence of this overflow, the depth of the island increased. It can readily be believed what an enormous quantity of elastic fluid was repiled up within its center, when at last it afforded no other openings, after the process of cooling the crust had taken place. At length, the time came when, despite the enormous thickness and weight of the upper crust, the mechanical forces that combustible gases below became so great that they actually upheaved the weighty back and made for themselves huge, gigantic shafts. Hence the volcanoes which suddenly arose through the upper crust, and next the craters, which burst forth at the summit of these new creations. It will be seen that the first phenomena in connection with the formation of the island were simply eruptive. To these, however, shortly succeeded the volcanic phenomena. Through the newly formed opening, escaped the marvelous mass of basaltic stones with which the plain we were now crossing was covered. We were trampling our way over heavy rocks in dark gray color, which, while cooling, have been molded into six-sided prisms. In the back distance, we could see a number of flattened cones, which formerly were so many fire-vomiting mouths. After the basaltic eruption was appeased and set at rest, the volcano, the force of which increased with that of the extinct craters, gave free passage to the fiery overflow of lava and to the mass of cinders and pumice stone, now scattered over the sides of the mountain like disheveled hair on the shoulders of Bacante. Here, in a nutshell, I had the whole history of the phenomena from which Iceland arose. All take their rise in the fierce action of interior fires, and to believe that the central mass did not remain in a state of liquid fire, white hot, was simply and purely madness. This being satisfactorily proved, was infinite folly to prevent the penetrate into the interior of the mighty earth. This mental lecture delivered to myself while proceeding on a journey did me good. I was quite reassured at the fate of our enterprise, and therefore went, like a brave soldier mounting a bristling battery, to the assault of old Sneffels. As we advanced, the road became every moment more difficult. The soil was broken and dangerous. The rocks broke and gave way under our feet, and we had to be scrupulously careful in order to avoid dangerous and constant falls. Hans advanced as calmly as he had been walking over Salisbury Plain. Sometimes he would disappear behind huge blocks of stone, and we momentarily lost sight of him. There was a little period of anxiety, and then there was a shrill whistle, just to tell us where to look for him. Occasionally, he would take it into his head to stop to pick up lumps of rock, and silently pile them up into small heaps, in order that we might not lose our way on our return. He had no idea of the journey we were about to undertake. At all events, the precaution was a good one, though how utterly useless and unnecessary, 
but I must not anticipate. Three hours of terrible fatigue, walking incessantly, had only brought us to the foot of the great mountain. This will give some notion of what we had still to undergo. Suddenly, however, Hans cried a halt. That is, he made signs to that effect, and a summary kind of breakfast was laid out in the lava before us. My uncle, who was now simply Professor Hardwig, was so eager to advance that he bolted his food like a greedy clown. This halt for refreshment was also a halt for repose. The professor was therefore compelled to wait the good pleasure of his imperturbable guide, who did not give the signal for departure for a good hour. The three Icelanders, who were as taciturn as their comrade, did not say a word, but went on eating and drinking very quietly and soberly. For this, our first real stage, we began to ascend the slopes of the Sneffels volcano, its magnificent snowy nightcap, as we began to call it, by an optical delusion very common in mountains, appeared to me to be close at hand. And yet how many long weary hours must elapse before we reached its summit? What unheard of fatigue must we endure? The stones on the mountainside, held together by no cement or soil, bound together by no roots of creeping herbs, gave way continually under our feet, and went rushing below into the plains, like a series of small avalanches. In certain places, the side of the stupendous mountain were at an angle so steep that it was impossible to climb upwards, and we were compelled to get round these obstacles as best we might. Those who understand alpine climbing will comprehend our difficulties. Often we were obliged to help each other along by means of our climbing poles. I must say this for my uncle, that he stuck as close to me as possible. He never lost sight of me, and on many occasions his arms supplied me with firm and solid support. He was strong, wiry, and apparently insensible to fatigue. Another great advantage with him was that he had the innate sentiment of equilibrium, for he never slipped or failed in his steps. The Icelanders, though, heavily loaded, climbed with the agility of mountaineers. Looking up every now and then at the height of the great volcano of Sneffels, it appeared to me wholly impossible to reach the summit on that side. At all events, that the angle of inclination did not speedily change. Fortunately, after an hour of unheard of fatigues, and of gymnastic exercises that would have been trying to an acrobat, we came to a vast field of ice, which wholly surrounded the bottom of the cone of the volcano. The natives called it the tablecloth, probably for some such reason as the dwellers in the Cape of Good Hope called their mountain Table Mountain, and their roads Table Bay. Here, to our mutual surprise, we found an actual flight of stone steps, which wonderfully assisted our ascent. The singular flight of stairs was, like everything else, volcanic. It had been formed by one of those torrents of stone cast up by the eruptions, and of which the Icelandic name is Stina. If the singular torrent had not been checked in its descent by the peculiar shape of the flanks of the mountain, it would have swept into the sea, and would have formed a new islands. Such as it was, it served us admirably. The abrupt character of the slopes momentarily increased, but these remarkable stone steps, a little less difficult than those of the Egyptian pyramids, were the one simple natural means by which we were enabled to proceed. About seven in the evening of that day, after having clambered up two thousand of these rough steps, we found ourselves overlooking a kind of spur or projection of the mountain, a sort of buttress upon which the cone-like crater, properly so called, leaned for support. The ocean lay beneath us at a depth of more than 3,200 feet, a grand and mighty spectacle. We had reached the region of eternal snows. The cold was keen, searching, and intense. The wind blew with extraordinary violence. I was utterly exhausted. My worthy uncle, the professor, saw clearly that my legs refused further service, and that, in fact, I was utterly exhausted. Despite his hot and feverish impatience, he decided with a sigh upon a halt. He called the eater duck hunter to his side. That worthy, however, shook his head. Ulfen for, was his sole spoken reply. It appears, says my uncle with a woebegone look, that we must go higher. He then turned to Hans and asked him to give him some reason for this decisive response. Mister, replied the guide. Yeah, mister. Yes, the mister, cried one of the Icelandic guides in a terrified tone. It was the first time he had spoken. <laughs> what does this mysterious word signify? I anxiously inquired. Look, said my uncle. I looked down upon the plain below, and I saw a vast, a prodigious volume of pulverized pumice stone, of sand, of dust, rising to the heavens in the form of a mighty water spout. It resembled the fearful phenomenon of a similar character known to the travelers in the desert of the Great Sahara. The wind was driving it directly towards that side of Sneffels on which we were perched. 
This opaque veil standing up between us and the sun projected a deep shadow on the flanks of the mountain. If the sand spout broke over us, we must all be infallibly destroyed, crushed in its fearful embraces. This extraordinary phenomenon, very common when the wind shakes the glaciers and sweeps over the arid plains, is in the Icelandic tongue called Mistor. Hastis! Hastis! cried our guide. Now I certainly knew nothing of Danish, but I thoroughly understood that his gestures were meant to quicken us. The guide turned rapidly in a direction which would take us to the back of the crater, all the while ascending slightly. We followed rapidly, despite our excessive fatigue. A quarter of an hour later, Hans paused to enable us to look back. The mighty whirlwind of sand was spreading up the slope of the mountain to the very spot where we had proposed to halt. Huge stones were caught up, cast into the air, and thrown about us, as during an eruption. We were happily a little out of the direction of the wind, and therefore out of reach of danger. But for precaution and knowledge of our guide, our dislocated bodies, our crushed and broken limbs, would have been cast to the wind, like dust from some unknown meteor. Hans, however, did not think it prudent to pass the night on the bare side of the cone. We therefore continued our journey in a zigzag direction. The 1,500 feet which remained to be accomplished took us at least five hours. The turnings and windings, the no thoroughfares, the marches and marches, turned that insignificant distance into at least three leagues. I never felt such a misery, fatigue, and exhaustion in my life. I was ready to faint from hunger and cold. The rarefied air at the same time painfully acted upon my lungs. At last, when I thought myself at the last gasp, about eleven at night, it being in that region quite dark, we reached the summit of Mount Sneffels. It was in an awful mood of mind, that despite my fatigue, before I descended into the crater, which was to shelter us for the night, I paused to behold the sun rise at midnight on the very day of its lowest declension, and enjoyed the spectacle of its ghastly pale rays cast upon the isle, which lay sleeping at our feet. I no longer wondered at people traveling all the way from England to Norway to behold this magical and wondrous spectacle.